Good morning and welcome. My name is Stephen Brucker, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here to the studio in the Flame Shop for the live stream series. Uh, today, we're going to talk about striking borosilicate colors and doing so in the flame. And we have a lot to do today, so I'm going to dive in. I'm going to give you a brief overview of what's going to happen today. We're going to talk about the process, and essentially, we're going to talk about two questions. What happens when we strike borosilicate colors? And how does it happen? How do we do it? Uh, from that point, we're going to talk about a project that uses transparent and opaque colors uh, in a process of striking them and then fusing them together to make, uh, I'll show it to you actually. So this three-dimensional hanging sculpture, which is an ornament, acorn and eight oak leaves with a small branch. So, so let's talk first about the actual process. Um, striking colors occur essentially because of the manipulation of silver metal within the composite structure of the glass. And essentially, we are going to talk about three different types of flames that are going to control this process. We have a flame that's called a neutral flame, an oxidizing flame, and then a reduction flame. And I'll demonstrate those in a moment. To manipulate the glass and the silver within the glass, we are going to use an oxidizing flame, high oxygen levels. And what that's going to do, it's going to start to dissolve the silver crystals. And what you'll see on the surface of the glass is this metallic haze. It'll look like a fog. We're getting the glass to go to a transparent level, so we're going to need to burn off that haze. We're going to manipulate it slightly, and then we're going to let it cool. And as it cools, what happens is we start to develop this spectrum of color. And the spectrum starts from clear, works to yellow, orange, red, red, purple, purple, blue, and then green. To get the latter part of that spectrum, we'll take that cooled glass that we've already manipulated and we'll reintroduce it into a reduction flame, meaning a flame that has a reduced amount of oxygen. And I know that's a lot of information without actually seeing the process, but to get you to that point, that's how we're going to do that. That's the transparent spectrum. The opaque spectrum is much easier. It's on or off. It's oxidizing or it's reducing. And I'll show you that. The two different families that we're going to work with, with regard to the glass, we're going to work in an amber-purple family. And in fact, we're going to actually work with double amber-purple because it's much more reactive. And for this purpose, we're going to, we're going to really take a look at that. It'll be much easier to see on, on the video. You could also use a dark blue green, or you could use a green amber purple uh, for the same type of reflecting points. Uh, with regard to the opaque, we'll be using a blue caramel, because that's super, super reactive uh, with regard to the flame types. So I think that's a, a really great one to use as a, an example. Essentially, oh, by the way, I'm a note taker, and I respond really well to notes. So you'll see me manipulating. It's not always the best thing to use paper in, in a flame shop, but it works for me in the process. It keeps me. Um, in line and on, on task. Essentially, we're going to start with our amber purple or our double amber purple. These are the transparent colors. And when we're done, what we're going to get to are variations of these colors. Now, it works best if you're using a gradient, especially if your work is using a gradient. And it works the best if it's on a thicker piece. So this is the ultimate that we're going to get to color-wise today. So before we do that, let's talk about the flame types. So a neutral flame. So a neutral flame is equal parts oxygen and propane. The column of flame as it goes up is, is symmetrical. It's not wide at one end. It's not laser focused. We're burning even amounts of fuel and oxygen in this process. And most of the time when we work at the flame, we, we're using this type of a, a flame. To get to an oxygenated flame, I'm going to kick the propane up just a bit. And here's a, a larger neutral flame. An oxidizing flame is one where you increase the amount of oxygen. And what happens is the flame becomes brighter or whiter. It becomes narrower, becomes a bit more aggressive, and it has a hissing sound to it. 
at this extreme end of the scale, it's a hissing sound, right? So an oxidizing flame. I equate these to like laser thin focused flames, super high heat. Let's go back to our neutral flame. All right, so even amounts, much quieter, much, much more relaxed in a neutral environment. If we're going to a reducing flame, we're going to decrease the amount of oxygen or reduce the amount of oxygen. And what we see in this type of a flame is that it gets softer. We call that bushier. It gets wider. And you start to see elements of yellow starting in the upper portions of the flame. So this is a much cooler flame as well. All right. Those are our three types. I'm going to go back to a neutral flame. I'm going to start with a transparent. And I'll start, I'll actually do both, but I'll start with the amber purple. So I'm going to make the flame just a little bit wider as a neutral flame. And I should also say, as I go through this process, we have the, the great fortune to have both Amanda Kranz and Harry Seaman, who are here in the studio with us to answer any of your questions as you're typing in. So these are the phenomenal folks who, you, who answer all of the questions most of the time uh, during any live stream. They're incredibly knowledgeable. I feel very fortunate that they're here in the space with me because they provide a great deal of support. If, however, you have questions about something my hands are doing or a technical process that I'm going through, please chime in um, and ask a question because I, I don't mind answering questions while I'm working. So by all means, go ahead. I'm going to increase my oxygen to get to that oxidant. And already there's a question. Fantastic. When you mention the manipulation of silver, does this also apply to colors like red Elvis or your star ruby, or is this just amber purple color? The, you know, it is similar, um, but it, it is most prevalent in the amber purple colors with regard to the silver. And this is why I chose them, because they're the most reactive. But it, is, it also is a, a situation where you're changing the chemistry by heating. So as I'm putting the amber purple in, you're going to see this haze and I'm going to try to manipulate it to a point where you can see that the haze is burning off. And what we're looking for is a transparent color. And you want to get this as hot as possible, almost to the point of boiling. You're not going to hurt it. Okay. So you want to make sure. With double amber purple or triple passion, this haze will come back in the manipulation process. You'll just go through and reheat it. So if you see it developing again, it just simply means that those crystals are shifting again. That, color, that silver is leaching up to the surface again. So I have a good amount here. I feel good. It looks transparent, relatively so. I'm just going to take my mashers. And for the purpose of today's demonstration, I'm just going to go ahead and flatten it out a little bit. And now I'm going to let that cool at least 20 seconds. So I'm just going to set it aside. I'll prep the, the other transparent that we have. So here again, dive right in. We start to see a haze on the surface. And then if we hold it there, that haze starts to, to burn away. Again, we're looking for that transparent. Feel good about that. And here too, I'm going to go ahead and just go ahead and give this a squeeze. Now, the interesting thing that's happening already in both of these is that the ambient heat from heating them is already starting the change. And we talked about that color spectrum where clear is the one end, but then yellow, orange, reds. In this area, you're starting to see. And when we combine yellow, orange, and red together with red purple, we get amber. And that's exactly the point. And that's because of the residual or ambient heat that was left in the glass as it's cooling. And it occurs in both of those. So we're on our way. We'll start with this. So from here, I have my oxidizing flame, but I want to cut the oxygen. That might be neutral. 
I'm going to reduce it all the way down to a point where yellow is coming out. Now, I don't need anything this large, so I'm also going to reduce my propane down and then reduce my oxygen again. I'm, I don't need a very big flame at all to do this process, but I do need to make sure that my flame is almost fully or three quarters of the way yellow. And I mean three quarters from this point where the candle is, we're starting up to here. I've waited a good amount of time. You can also cool it by waving it. And from this point, maybe a little bit more, bring it to the tip of the flame. As far as the geography of the flame, this is the base for me, this is the tip, right? So I'm gonna bring it up to the tip of the flame and I'm gonna hold it there consistently. I'm gonna switch to the other side. I'm gonna give this a little bit more oxygen, tighten that flame up. I have a little bit of carbon there, so it was just a little too intense. The thing is that you want it to be warmed, but you really don't want it to glow for very long at all. And you can start to see that it is shifting in color, it's starting to darken. If it does start to glow, just lift it out. Okay. And so you might say, well, Stephen, that's just completely amber. There's no purple in that at all. The next step is to wait for it to actually cool. And as it cools, it starts to bloom into those other colors. So as we're doing that, and you can already start to see that it's happening here, these clouds. All right. What I'll do is I'll set this aside and we'll reduce the other. So it's cool. Relatively. I also have asbestos hands, as most flame workers do, right? or most glass workers. So at the tip of the flame, the very outer edge, and I'm actually past the color here. That's where I start. What you don't want to do is just to bring it towards the base of the candles, because you can really go to a very, very dark stage quickly. And I'll talk about that as far as troubleshooting in just a moment. So some common mistakes or common situations where that might happen where you say, well, I thought I followed directions, but it doesn't come out like yours did. What's going on? So we'll get to that in a second. I think that's where all the useful information is. Not necessarily watching people do things perfectly, but when things go awry, right? So here too, it's darkening up. Now we're gonna let that sit for a second or two. If we go back to our first one, we're starting to see those purples starting to, to arise. It'll still continue. A good way to check, or if you get it too dark, you can reheat it slightly, going back to a neutral flame, and change the, the density of it. What does that mean? I'm gonna thin this out. So I'm just gonna reheat the surface, both sides. So this is probably at a half millimeter in thickness right now, this disc. If I attach this clear rod and then just pull a little twisted cane from it, we're gonna see how it will change. Just wanna make sure the whole thing is evenly heated. Give it a test, it could lose a little bit more heat. Wait a couple seconds, pull, and then twist. So we went from an extremely dark color now to a very light amber with some of that purple still here at the ends. So there are ways in which you can change it even after it has struck. So I'm going to just cut this free. Oops. 
or break it free. Another question for you, Stephen. Sure. What Well, I recommend you talk to the Reikau Library, <laughs> by all means. For beginning of uh, flameworking, Bando's um, ser uh, series of books are just phen phenomenal. Um, Bando Dunham, The Contemporary Lampworking, Volumes 1, 2, and 3 are phenomenal ones. If you're interested in um, cane work uh, as a, in a, in a beginning or a, a means of developing technique. Uh, Mylon Townsend has a phenomenal book uh, that dives deeply into, um, into all manner of cane, pulling cane, and color variations. I'm just going to leave this to the side. Let's go back to our other one, our double pad. I hope that helps to answer the questions. So here it's darkened quite, no, quite a bit. We have those purples happening here. Let's talk about troubleshooting. So what happens if you go into the flame. Let's cut this off. Let's actually do this, because we have a couple of seconds. You go in, you start to manipulate it, and it turns yellow or milky. But it never gets to a point where it actually strikes. And that is a result of <clears throat> using a neutral flame, a flame that's not hot enough. And so at that point, what happens is you never actually burn off the silver, that foggy haze. You'll get some ambient change at the base, but your glass will start to, as this cools, it will look yellowy and milky. So that's an indication that if that occurs, you didn't get hot enough, right? You have some transparency, but not a lot. And the tip of that is going to be like, not a great color at all. Another popular mistake or change with the results, if you are in your reducing flame and you're trying to get that color to happen and shift, it's this option of bobbing in and out, right? Taking it in and out. And so instead of having a consistent application of the color, what happens is you get a flash of color and then a flash of cool and a flash of heat and a flash of cool. And it doesn't actually ever move into those purples. Um, it'll stay into that. And the third most common situation is a situation like this, where you do get some color, but it turns super, super, super dark. And that's essentially because we've stayed too long in the flame, in that reducing flame. Um, it can be returned. You just take it back into that uh, oxidizing flame. You will then resuspend the silver crystals. Um, you'd let it cool consistently, and then you would just bring it back down through that, that process. Wait your 20 seconds or until you feel it's super cool. And then just go back in and do your, your flame annealing, your, your reduction flame to get it to the point where it's, it's going to shift. Um, so that is the process for your transparents. Let's talk about, is there a question? Yes. Excellent. Uh, does the striking process not work if you're using an oxidizing flame but holding the glass further away from the tip of the flame? Ah, so good question. Um, in your oxidizing flame, what you're doing is you're suspending those crystals. And at some point, in order to make that spectrum bloom, you do have to cool it. So if you stay in an oxidizing flame and come out, you're going to cool it some, to some degree. But remember, even if you're at an oxidizing, in a neutral flame, you're, you're at a point where, here we are in a neutral flame, right? So at the base level at the candles right here, 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit. But up here, maybe 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. But if you increase the oxygen of that, that temperature at the outer end much higher. So you're really not ever getting to the point where you're consistently cooling it, bringing it down, waiting that 20 seconds until the majority of that, those crystals can then regrow. Remember, they grow as uh, wavelengths of light that we can see. And so once they're suspended, great. But once you start to cool it, then they start to grow back into the body of the glass, and that color spectrum starts to bloom. And that's exactly why we see this from the ambient heat, right? The first ones to happen, the first stages are your reds, your orange, your yellows. And you see that without any type of 
actual reduction flame there. So you could, I suppose you could try it. I, I, I would be interested to know how that would work if you were trying to do it up here. I think it might take you a lot longer. Um, but I, I personally have never done it, so it could, it could work. Who knows? I want to go on now, in the interest of time, to talk about the opaque. And this is blue caramel. It's part of the cobalt family. Right? Uh, we're going to go to our oxidizing flame. And this is really like the on or off switch. We're going to oxidize it. You know it's working because the outer half of the flame, the back half of the flame, will turn pink when you start this process. It will not have a haze developed. You won't be able to see that. So you can tell you're doing it correctly when you have blue flame here and pink flame here. And I'm just going to grab onto it and do a little pull. And what we should be getting is a series of like sage greens and some blues. Right? So lovely pastel green here, some striking of blue. Right? Fine. To reduce it, or to get it to move more towards the caramel spectrum, we're going to first put it in an oxidizing flame. And then we're going to reduce the oxygen. And this is why I say it's either one or the other. So let's flatten it a little. Still give it a little bit more heat. Great. Now we're going to cut that heat out. We don't have to wait with this one. But we do have to wait for the glow to come out. And so what we will get here is more of this caramel color, earthy color, sometimes gray. Not very attractive. Um, but it does pull that color down. You don't get those attractive greens. You get grays, caramels. Now, the longer you stay, the darker it'll get. And if you get to a point where you're starting to see like terracotta or brown streaking, you know you've stayed too long and the glass is essentially devitrifying because of too much heat for too long of a period of time. So blue caramel. Your extremes are pretty pronounced. I love this color. I'm not so much a fan of the, the caramel aspect, but that's just me. It can be very useful though, especially, I know Kim Thompson uses this um, to make her creatures, right? So it, they, this kind of necrotic, dead zombie-like looking parts of the human anatomy, that's really good for, for that. So it really depends on, on what you're looking to do. All right, so let's talk about what we're looking to do. Let's go on. And unless there are additional questions, we can go on to the production. Um, the very first part I'm going to do is I'm going to make the branch structure which supports with a small loop. So there's a little branch here. Then I'll come in and I'll make these leaves. I'll show you the color coiling process that I use to create the acorn. I'll t create the top of the acorn. And then we'll do an assemblage. I've pre-made some of these, but not all of these. <clears throat> so let's start with, yeah. So I have already placed uh, a short of blue caramel. I had an absolute revelation the other day. I was cleaning up my studio at home and reorganizing different parts. And I found three complete rods of blue caramel. And in today's day and age, <laughs> I was like, I, I completely won the lottery with this. Because as we all know, if you were are at all interested in finding it, it's quite difficult at this stage. So I'm just going to heat about an inch of this. Then I'm going to transfer it into my, my left hand. Actually, I might just keep it here. All right, so I'm using these two millimeter rods as a handle. They won't become part of the final piece, but I'm constantly using them. Uh, so now I'm just introducing heat into the entirety of it, back and forth. Create the upper stem. As it cools, 
I'm going to reheat a little bit more. Wait a couple seconds. This is my complete and total mantra. Heat, wait, then manipulate. All right, so heat the glass, wait the appropriate amount of time, then manipulate. So now I'm going to put a side branch just in, on one portion of it. I'll connect it over here. That is a hot seal. I'll come back and do the other side of it in just a moment. So I'm waiting one to two seconds, just manipulating a little bit here. And then to give this a little bit more authenticity, maybe a couple small branches off of that. Again, hot seals. If I was a patient flame worker, and I'm not, I would bridge this to ensure that it doesn't move. I prefer to live a little dangerously. I'm OK with that. So part one, and then just do a little bit more over here on part two. Again, these are hot seals, meaning they're full true connections. Uh, they're not cold seals, which would be temporary. I'm envisioning that our acorn is going to hang here. So I'm going to put a loop at the top. To do that, I'm just going to bring it into the side of the flame. Make sure that connection is super hot, meaning that it's fully fused. And now I'm going to just heat the residual glass. Wait my one to two seconds, form a loop structure. And then bring that over to the side. And maybe I'll add it a little bit more to make it look like an additional part of a branch. OK. From this point, it's always a little tenuous because we want this to hang perfectly, and we'll come back to this. We also want the weight of our acorn to be suspended here. We'll have leaves. So I'm going to leave this as it is right now, but I know that I'm coming back at the very end to reposition all of it. Okay. Our blue caramel has done exactly what we want in this oxidizing flame. It has become green. It has become blue. It's got a whole spectrum. We're happy with it. Great. I'm going to just pop it in the garage here in the kiln for just a second or two. My kiln's sitting at 1050. Next step is going to be the creation of these leaf structures. Right? So these are stylized um, oak leaves. I like the fact that they have some movement to them. So we're going to start. Again, using our oxidizing flame and a handle, blue caramel is going to be a center stem. And I'm heating maybe half an inch. So even heat. I'm looking for no dark spots within the glass itself. Dark means that it's cold. Cold glass won't move. And so I'm going to use a pull method and then a push method. So as it's cooling, again, heat, weight, manipulate, I'm going to pull. And then I'm just going to push it back to create that S curve. That's going to be the base of our center spine of our leaf. I'm going to pick up good old standard amber purple. And I'm going to trace a line on each side. So this is going to be the center body of the the oak leaf. Hot connection here. I'm just bringing the, the curve underneath the flame so that heat hits only the outside. And this is a critical part. I'm going to heat just this edge, but I don't want to put the entirety of it into the flame. If I did, then gravity would take this and pull it. So I want the structural support of this side of, of the glass to remain unheated, therefore solid. And I want to connect the heat only on this side. 
where I stripe it down. So this is why I'm bringing it just underneath. I can see that it's hot because there's a, a small little dot because I have a larger mass in my right hand, which is the amber purple. I'm heating that much more. When I go to make the connection point, I have to do it just briefly and then trace down, laying that amber purple right on top of the pre-established form. And then let the oxygen and the flame cut it free. And then rinse and repeat for the other side, same thing. Here again, I'm going to establish one point of connection. Ensure that my amber purple is warm enough and then just lay it straight on. So that's the outlined center portion. From there, let's use our, our triple passion. We're going to create four nodes on these to start to allow our maple leaf to take a, a shape that looks like a maple leaf. So I'm just going to apply the same technique as before, a small amount of heat, and then just an attachment here. So there's one. Two and two on the other side. Number three. And you can see now already the ambient heat is causing that amber purple to move into the reds, the oranges, that amber spectrum. It has cooled in the process. And now it's starting to bloom. So what we're going to do now is to use our mashers and we're going to heat these nodes and then flatten them out to provide even more structure for our leaf. The cool thing about this laying this process in, sometimes it creates moments where there are holes in the leaf. And I love that serendipity when that happens. All right. We're going to put this in at an angle and we're going to give it a gentle squeeze. It's going to flatten them out. Again, we've not changed our flame temperature at all yet. Still using an oxidizing flame. Okay. So there's a little thick still so we can bend it. Can flatten it out just a bit more. All right. Previously, I have created some stringers out of my blue caramel. I can demonstrate really briefly how that happens. I know there are many techniques in which you can do this. Most people will tell you heat two inches at a time and pull. I need something that's really long, so I don't have a lot of time to just heat and reconnect. I just grab onto it, keeping it about maybe two inches from the base of the, the candle, and then just continually pull. All right. And as long as you heat a center part, you can go and go and go and go, which is the way that I prefer. Because it's going to be necessary for the next part. What we're going to do is we're going to add some veining to the leaf. This will work. So we're going to cut this in the flame. And so from the central stem, we'll draw a diagonal line across each one of our nodes. And then we'll do that on the other side. To do this, I don't need all of this heat. I actually need a small flame. I have another mantra, which is big job, big flame, small job, small flame. All right, makes sense. So this has been out of the heat for a little bit. So I'm just going to give it a little bath, make sure everybody's happy so we don't have cracking. All right, so I'm going to start touching the center of that blue caramel. And then I'm just going to 
draw the line across the node area. Okay. I'm heating only the stringer to do this. I'm not really actually heating the surface of the leaf because I really want the stringer to move. In a moment, we'll have the other part move, but for right now, this is all we need. Okay, so now rinse and repeat on the other side. Okay. Okay, now here's where things get fun because we're gonna to start to articulate the very end shapes of this, uh, the outer edge. So I'm gonna bring the leaf shape underneath and I'm going to reheat the outer edge so that it becomes fluid. And then I'm just gonna lay the stringer down on top of it. And then I'm gonna lift it off to pull it into that very thin articulated shape. Now I'm going to heat the center part of that node, touch it with a cold stringer, and pull. And what's happening is the veining is melting in. At the center of the leaf, it starts It's a raised structure. And as we come into the parts that are pulled and heated, it becomes part of the entire body. So we're going to go all the way around. Second part here, same situation. We lay it on top, give it another heat, touch it, and then just lift, pull. Yes. I've got a question for you. Yes. Steven. What tools do you suggest for a beginner framework? Oh, well, uh, I should tell you that I, this is not a paid endorsement. However, there are, many, <laughs> there are many companies, but the one that I find is the best is uh, Mountain Glass. And Mountain Glass has a full beginner's kit, which would provide you um, not only a torch, uh, but it'll provide you regulators. It'll provide you the hoses that are, are necessary to, to operate your propane tanks and your oxygen tanks. It'll provide you a preliminary set of tools, which would be tweezers and a striker. Um, they will provide you safety glasses, critical to, to working in, um, in flame working. Um, you know, it doesn't come with all the bells and whistles. It's not doing triple sukaharas and double sow cows. You're not getting advanced tools, but it's enough to get you into the, the game. Um, and it's, it, it's a little bit of an investment, but you know, far less than if you were going to try to set up your own hot shop, for sure, right? So um, part of that, too, depending as you're starting out, is to, to buy a, a kiln. That would be an important first step. Um, and I would encourage you to really do your research. Think about what it is you want to make uh, and how that will evolve over the first five years of your glassmaking career. Um, there are kilns that are, you know, like the tabletop that we have here, uh, all the way up to very large ones. Um, there are also kilns specifically made for borosilicate uh, glasswork. So the Scott family, which is behind me over here, there's red number, and they come in multiple sizes. So, you know, if you're first starting out, do you have to have a kiln? Well, probably not. I mean, if you're making marbles and maybe small ornaments, you could probably uh, get away with just annealing those in, in a product called vermiculite, which is a component of potting soil. It's a great thermal insulator. Um, so you, you could experiment that way uh, if you're doing you know, small, small work. Once you start to get above things that are about you know, a nickel in, in thickness, you're going to need to have a, a, a more substantial kiln situation. Okay, so we've articulated our leaf. It has some motion, it has some variation in color. I'm not gonna go through the, the actual reduction process right now, um, but I could, you know, if I was just going to do so uh, with regard to the way it's gonna be finished, I would certainly reduce the whole thing. I'm heating the midsection because I wanna put a little bit of additional curvature to it. 
All right, because I know it's going to hang. All right, so if we did go ahead and do this, I would leave it for a good minute to two. Um, then I would reintroduce it at the top of a flame, of a reducing flame, so that I'm slowly bringing heat back in. I don't want, I mean, it's borosilicate. It'll do a great job of resisting thermal shock. However, uh, we don't want to take our chances with it if, it if it does crack. And worst case scenario, if it does crack, we can always fix it. But if we don't have to, let's not do that. All right. So I'm going to rapidly move on to creating the acorn. So the first thing I'm going to do, <clears throat> I'm going to set up a tool that I can transfer and build my acorn on. And I'll need that in a letter. This is a little bit of, um, I believe that color is called honey bee. Don't quote me on that. There's a gentleman I work with, Rob Opinski, Outlaw Glass. He is the master of all the color names and sourcing all the colors. He would know. I don't. But it's OK. It's not important. It's simply an amber color that I've also pulled into a stringer that I'm going to use to create my acorn. And the reason I'm doing this, I'm going to do it with a clear glass, and I'm going to overlay an amber stringer over the top. And I do this for two reasons. Number one, if I just condensed this amber down and made it into a sphere to make that acorn, it would be incredibly dark, so much so that it would be almost ominous and not inviting to look at, in my opinion. So I don't do that. Um, I will string this uh, amber that I've pulled very thinly into the stringer onto clear because the clear will be a much larger base. And then it'll be transparent as well. So any light that passes through will just pass through the amber stringer. And it'll look much lighter. Um, secondarily, boro can be expensive. Boro rods can be literally expensive, up to $9, $10 a a piece you know, for one rod. So if you can be economical with this and stretch this thin, still create the, the desired look, but just wrap it over clear, then you're saving yourself a, a great deal of, of cash, especially if you're using this in a production man, method, right? So I've warmed uh, this 10 millimeter rod. I'm just going to put about maybe one inch and I'm coiling. So the rod, the clear rod stays underneath the flame. The stringer comes over the top. It's not going to be perfect. But I'm trying to line it up. Now, if I have a gap, I can always go back in and refill the gap. Um, but again, applying the heat only to the stringer and not to the glass rod. Occasionally, you see me flash it and bring the clear glass rod up into the flame. And that's simply just to maintain and stabilize the heat so it doesn't get too cold down there and crack. Okay. So we're going to continue to wrap this. So this goes now back to my theory or my process here of larger job. We're going to condense and melt this all in. So I'm going to turn on my outside oxygen, my outside propane, and I'm going to get a very wide flame from this. So we're going to rapidly condense this down. 
And what we're looking for is a spherical form. By holding it at a 45 degree angle, gravity is pulling the molten glass down towards my left hand, down towards the tabletop. And it's melting all those uh, coils, compressing them as well. I do have to turn it and maintain that, that rotation so that everything falls on center. I'm looking for that. And with the larger flame, it won't take very long to do this at all. Okay. To make it spherical, I'm going to hold this rod horizontal and continue to turn. I don't need any of this outside heat for the rest of the production work. So I'm going to take my tool, which essentially is this tiny little bit of uh, amber glass at the end. If I were to use a clear end to con connect this, there would always be this tiny little bit of clear at the end, and I want to avoid that. What I'm going to do is to pull the very bottom part of the acorn into shape so it makes that curvature and that pointed area. So to do that, I'm heating just the, the right-hand side of the acorn. I'm going to make this a solid connection, but to do so, I'm going to apply it first at eye level. And this is a trick I learned from a Venetian. By placing it eye level, I'm pushing in and I'm pulling out, and then I'm just going to turn and form that bottom subtle edge of the acorn. Now that I have it, I'm going to make sure that that connection is solid. And so I'm just heating that until they melt together perfectly, and then I can come back up to eye level and ensure that my acorn is well positioned and it's centered. OK. From here, I'm going to need to cut my acorn free, put a cap on it, and then a stem. So now I'm going to just put the heat in one area right on the edge. We call this area the shoulder. So from the spherical part to the clear rod, I'm just heating that component part. Might be easier for you to see if I do it this way. I want this to be a constriction at the top, so I'm going to use a tool called my diamond shears. And essentially, I'm going to constrict by turning and gently squeezing. It puts a lovely constriction in the center of that. I'm going to come back in and now just heat that. And with that amount of constriction, I can pull the clear rod free. And cut it using the oxygen. Always set the hot parts away from you. All right. I want to keep my acorn relatively warm, but I'm going to create the cap. And I want my cap to match everything else that I've done so far up to this point. So back to my oxidizing flame, I go. You can see here in the acorn that it does have that transparency at the bottom. It has a little bit more density at the top. And I'm going to use this little bit of clear glass that's left over, and I'm just going to wrap. Here again, the same process. I'm keeping now the blue caramel in the center of the flame. And I'm wrapping and winding it around that central spark, maybe to the size of a nickel, maybe, maybe a little larger. Super important to make sure that that blue caramel is moving. It's mobile. It's flexible. Otherwise, you could snap off your support in your left hand. This looks good to me. I'm now going to melt it all into a ball and condense it down. By creating this funnel shape, I keep the heat inside to melt it, and I'm not affecting the outside of the acorn. Just increasing the intensity of the heat so that it becomes a sphere.
So once it does, we're going to compress it. We're going to shape it. We're going to add a stem. And then we'll start the process of putting everything together. OK, so we have our sphere. We want to make sure it's centered. And then we're going to invert it onto our graphite pad over here. I like to set up my hand prior to. So my palm up means that I can just place it like so with relatively good accuracy. I make no promises whatsoever that it will be perfect, but OK. So it's warm enough. So I press, turn, press, turn, press, turn, press, turn. And that should flatten it out to some degree. That's the beginning shape. From here, we're going to use the angle of our graphite paddle. And we're going to place it underneath the flame. We're going to heat just the dome. Because that paddle's been sitting for a little bit, it might be a little too cold. So I'm just going to give it a little heat. The pressure is really, really light. I equate it to uh, if you had to move an egg that didn't have an egg shell. You know, sometimes it's just the, the sac around an egg. How would you move that? That's the same amount of pressure. It's not muscling it at this point. And you want to make sure that your blue caramel is really hot and that you don't see any dark spots. Dark spots mean that glass isn't moving. And in this application, we want it to be really, really subtle because we're putting a small little angle to create the cap of that acorn. And we'll go back in and we'll do that again. And you can see that it, those darker spots mean that's where it's cooled and that the graphite has pulled the heat out. So we want to make sure we go back in and make sure everything is smooth. And you, of course, could continue this multiple times. And changing the angle will, of course, assist you, which you can see here, too. All right. Let's build a little stem for this guy or gal. It doesn't have to be very large, but it does have to be a centered connection. So this might be a blue-green amber, too. So we might just change it up. It might look slightly different. So we coil on a small amount. And then just make sure that it's centered. So I'm going to bring it up to eye level and continue to look. You could stylize this any way you'd like. The key is you've got to make sure that the connection is completely solid and so it flows through. Worst case scenario, you've got this beautiful acorn. Then in a day or two, some vibration comes along because you didn't seal it. And now you have a lovely branch and an oak leaf stem and an acorn that's on the floor. No good. All right, so now we're just going to come back in. Heat, turn, heat, turn, heat, turn. OK, and we'll cut this free. And that might be just enough. Actually, it might be too much. Great. So now the rest of the work is all about assembly. There's our, our acorn. And to assemble, this is the ultimate in small job, small flame. So it's, Before you get to that, yeah, yeah. Do you mind answering a question? So um, folks are wondering about the differences in working soft, soft silver strikers um, in soft glass versus boro. Soft glass is not an area that I am an expert in at all. So unfortunately, I am not going to be your source. Um, but there are many people who are. Um, I one of the most prolific producers currently is uh, Leah Neitz, who is in Ohio. She's an amazing soft glass worker. Um, N-E-I-T-Z is her last name. By all means, check her out. Uh, she makes incredible objects, uh, blown goblets that are not annealed. Um, Garrett Oaks, also on the West Coast, uh, someone who is certainly skilled in soft glass work. And of course, you have a whole host of other historic fi figures. But I am, I am not that person, so I unfortunately cannot provide you that information. All right. What I'm going to do is I'm going to place this where I believe the point of balance is. But I reserve the right to be wrong. I frequently am in this. Um, a small amount of heat, 
I have a larger mass with my right hand, the acorn, so I'm gonna heat that more than I am gonna heat the branch. I'm gonna apply them together and I'm gonna ensure that they flow together. Okay. Here again, if you were a much more patient flame worker, you would bridge all of these things to ensure stability and security. Um, I am not that patient. All right, so if it moves, it's okay. Reposition it, right? So as long as it's attached, which it is currently, we can take this handle off. We won't need it anymore. And this will start to inform whether or not it's centered and balancing correctly. All right, so because we can use our small hook and currently, right now, it's not going to be, right? Because this hook is way over here. This loop is way over. It needs to be this way. So heat only the loop application. Redirect it upwards. Before you put any tool, especially a metal tool, on your glass, warm it so it doesn't create shock. And then test. Looks fairly good. Maybe it needs to come a little this way. Okay, I'm happy with that. I think that'll work. Again, using our super small flame, any of your leaves to begin with, try to keep the majority of the leaf out of the structure. Introduce heat gradually and gently and you're gonna put them in a triangular shape around. So again, more heat here. Attach, ensure that they're fused correctly. And you do have about three seconds to position them. Back in and ensure that they're fused. Leaf one, okay. Leaf number two. Here's where you have to be careful of a thing called residual heat. When you send the heat this way, it may be hitting other parts of the structure and deflecting, which could be disastrous in some cases. So really be mindful of where that residual heat is going and where you're applying it. Uh, we can go right here with this one. Leaf number two attached. And then finally, Again, have like two to three seconds of work time. And then from there, test it. Last step in the process. Just remove the tip. You can go back in and do that a couple of times if you wanted to, just pull it off. But there you have it. So striking colors, transparent, opaque. At this point, you would pop it in the kiln. And there it is. It can also be done in double format or the single ones. 
I hear the whistle, which is an indication that it's 12 noon, which means our time together is ending. I will invite you to tune in to our next one, uh, our next live stream, which will feature my colleague Richard Whiteley. It's been a pleasure, uh, by all means, to be with you for this past hour. Thank you again to Harry and to Amanda, to Brad, our, our digital team, for, for all of your assistance. Uh, please send the questions uh, as well. I'll be happy to answer them. Thanks so much, folks.